Hello and welcome back to The Walking Dead Retrospective, where today we'll be jumping headfirst into the larger world arc. And like I've been saying for the past few videos now, buckle up, because things are about to get very, very wild in the comparison sense. We've got so much to talk about, so without further ado, let us dive in. Just to catch up on where we currently stand, the book has now essentially caught up to the TV version after the No Way Out time skip, and that is also where we'll open. We see Carl scream as he awakens from yet another nightmare. Rick, of course, rushes in to see what's wrong, and we get this brief conversation between the two. Despite Rick's efforts to calm him down, Carl says that it was terrible and that it didn't feel like a dream. There was this boy that was younger than him, and he shot him. He knew he was bad, but he didn't like it. This is of course in reference to Ben, revealing that those memories are also ones that Carl has somewhat lost. He is still aware of them on a subconscious level, but he doesn't actually remember shooting him. We talked plenty about this last time already, but as I said there, I think it is super unfortunate we never got to see any of this memory loss stuff in the adaptation, as I think it was really interesting in the books. And in case you missed it, my extended thoughts on the whole memory loss thing are in the previous video. The next morning though, and this is very much a thing in both versions, the group is dangerously low on supplies. So Michonne and Abraham prepare to go out on a supply run. In the show, on the other hand, it's Rick and Daryl who go out. And the major difference here is that the supply run in the adaptation is an actual supply run and Jesus only shows up around halfway through the episode. Whereas in the book, they find him hiding in a car from walkers basically right away. And the whole introduction here is also vastly different. In the TV version, we of course have the famous Benny Hill chase sequence and all that. It's essentially just a bit of a breather episode before we delve into the Negan saga, and as such, all of the events are basically a lighter version of the comic book. Sure, there are some tense moments, but all things considered, there really are no serious confrontations or anything like that. In the comic, on the other hand, things do get a bit heated right away. And we're also immediately shown Jesus' martial arts skills as he pretty easily gets the upper hand on both Michonne and Abraham. And that's even with Abraham actively trying to gun him down. And because it is just Michonne and Abraham, there's also the added dimension of Jesus just telling them to go get their leader since they don't appear to be in a talkative mood. And it's here that a sort of a trend, I suppose, is set of people being surprised by the fact that Rick is the leader. As Jesus here says that Rick must be a absolutely new level of Chad to boss around someone as big as Abe. And as we'd also see with Negan, I think this is in large part because of Rick's outward appearance in the books. He's missing a hand, he generally looks extremely rugged, and when he speaks, he cuts right to the chase. He just looks like a leader if that makes sense, but just keep that in mind for now. But one more thing to note before we move on, in the book, Jesus' name is Paul Monroe, but it was changed for the adaptation to be Paul Rovia. This was done with the intention to remove any confusion surrounding his links to Douglas and Deanna, because there are none. It just so happens that they shared a last name, which, to be fair, is a bit of a weird decision on Kirkman's part. When he was asked about this, he said that it's merely a common last name in the DC area, which does make perfect sense. But I do think that changing it for the adaptation was a good move just to avoid unnecessary misunderstandings. Because of course, it makes sense in the real world sense, but when it comes to the story, it is a little bit confusing. But anyway, unlike in the TV version where Jesus is knocked out and taken to Alexandria almost right away, in the books, he already introduces both himself as well as his community of 200. Keep this number in mind for later, by the way. But he essentially talks about how integrating Alexandria and their trade routes would prove greatly beneficial for both. Though when Rick is surprised by the mention of there being two more communities out there, those of course being the Kingdom and the Sanctuary, we get the super iconic panel of Jesus, almost in a fourth wall breaky manner asking Rick, Wait, you really think you're the only survivors? Your world's certainly about to change. And yes, in a meta sense, I do very much think that Kirkman was essentially speaking to us as the reader as well here. 
But while Rick is seemingly interested in the deal, he merely baits Jesus into giving him his hand and knocks him out in the book version as well. And before we follow up with Jesus, we get a scene with Carl back at Alexandria, which I think goes a long way towards showing the missed potential with him. We see him chilling with little Judith, which, one, is just super wholesome. But two, when Michonne walks up asking about why Carl didn't put down the zombified Diana in the woods, we get this super interesting conversation between the two. He essentially tells her that he thought it should be someone who loved her, once again expressing his much more emotional sides that he doesn't really have in the books. And it's basically in this part of the season that my big Carl rewrite would take place. We've talked a lot about how Chandler is basically an adult, so most of the scenes from the book simply would not translate. Which is exactly why I think scenes like this do work. He's older, and he's much more mature, so it's no surprise that he's not as bold as he is in the book. So what I'd propose, and is actually something we'd see in a scene which we'll talk about in a second, is exactly that. Make Carl essentially the embodiment of Rick once they reached Alexandria originally. He mostly fits in, he's not emotionally detached, he has something to protect, that being Judith, and so on. Essentially just make him seem mostly chill. But then give him that killer instinct that is ready to turn on at any moment. Not in the almost silly sense of him getting in Negan's truck, because that was very, very poorly translated in my opinion, but in a much more cold and realistic tone. And like I also said last time, the whole memory loss thing could have been leveraged here as well. Not as a stark transformation, but rather as a stepping stone for re-establishing his colder nature. Because again, getting shot in the face, I would imagine, very much changes how a person thinks about the world. But yeah, we'll touch on this again in just a bit, so hold that thought. Returning to the whole Jesus situation, the differences here are also quite staggering. In the books, following his capture, it's essentially pedal to the metal preparations for war. Rick calls on the most important members of the group and immediately assigns them tasks in the case of an imminent attack. Essentially, the idea here is that the group is expecting a retaliation from Jesus' group and are reacting accordingly. In the show, on the other hand, we do not get absolutely any of that. Sure, Rick does mention that the day was rough, but that was more so relating to losing that truck full of food and no war preparations are made just yet. And it's also here that Rick and Michonne formally get together. And on this note, it's actually been a super surprising discovery for me to hear that many people don't think their relationship developed naturally, because I've always thought that it made perfect sense. With all the changes from the book, I think their friendship naturally became stronger and stronger and ultimately developed into a romantic relationship, exactly like it did with Andrea in the books. Not to mention them bonding over very similar trauma and hearing people that we saw back in Season 3. So yeah, I'm not sure whether I'm in the minority here, but I really didn't think it was strange at all, because clearly Michonne in the adaptation is much much different from the comic book, and has pretty explicitly been given Andrea's role in many many situations already. But yes, in the story sense, Rick really isn't worried about Jesus for the time being. On the flip side, in the comics, Rick is so certain that there are more people out there that we even get the scene where Rick has posted Andrea as a lookout while he along with Abe and Michonne go to search the area. And I think these couple of sentences by Rick sum it up very very well, as he says, Make no mistake, we are bait. And this is one of those things that are sort of difficult to talk about in retrospect. As on one hand, Rick's reaction is exactly what you'd expect from him at that point. They had the Marauders attack just a few weeks ago after all. But on the other, if you look at it from the story point of view, it seems almost funny in retrospect because obviously there is no one out there. And this is also one of the reasons why I think it was changed for the adaptation. Considering that the whole prepping for war thing would happen in just a couple of episodes with their assault on the satellite outpost, it would have just retread the same ground it literally just covered. So I think that was also a strong reason why they just chose to remove it outright. Though as they continue searching the area and clearly find nothing, there's this epiphany moment for Rick, where he says that none of what they're doing right now even phases him anymore. 
He's so used to the walkers and the dangers of the world that he essentially accepts the possibility of Jesus lying to them or even luring them into a trap. But even with that, he's willing to take that chance. And we then get another great splash panel of Rick saying, there's a much larger world out there. And finishing with, even if he is lying, we'll take everything they've got and leave them for the dead. Again, obviously we all know where this leads, but try to picture yourself back in that moment where everything was an uncertainty. And with that in mind, I think Kirkman was being very cheeky and very purposeful with basically everything here. They meet this guy with a seemingly impossible claim of over 200 people living in safety, and then even mentioning more communities. Then, it turns out that it was in fact not too good to be true at all, and Jesus was being 100% truthful. And just when things are finally looking up, everything comes crashing down as Negan comes into the picture. And the reason why I bring this whole thing up is because I think this is a dimension that we never really saw in the adaptation, for reasons we'll be delving into in just a moment. But to those unfamiliar with the book, the introductory period to both the larger world as well as Negan specifically, for me at least, already has a significantly different tone to basically everything right from the get-go. Though with his previously mentioned realization in mind, Rick assembles a group to set out for Hilltop, but before he does, he goes to talk to Andrea. In short, he wants her to stay behind. But Andrea cuts back telling Rick that they're the ones who live, she's not going to die, and that he needs her. Essentially, she just says that she will disprove everything Rick said before about everyone around him dying, and telling him that she is going whether he wants her to or not. As we've already talked about before, this was just one of those instances of her pushing back on Rick's decisions when they're not exactly justified, and it ultimately just strengthens their trust in each other. In the adaptation, on the other hand, there are quite a few differences. First of all, unlike in the books, we don't really see any interrogation with Jesus or anything like that. Instead, he shows up in Rick's and Michonne's bedroom. So the whole freeing himself angle is adapted from later in the book. Another change here are the immediate events following this, as we see Jesus calmly waiting for Rick and Michonne to get dressed, only to be held up at gunpoint by Carl. In the book though, while Jesus is being held captive, Carl himself would seek him out and just go to talk with him. And also, the whole Carl finding out Michonne and Rick are together is a remix of what happens later in the books as well, where very similarly, Carl is surprised seeing Andrea and Rick together. But because Carl is a bit younger in the books, there's also a quite comedic line of him just asking, Andrea? I thought she was together with the other guy. But anyway, returning to the TV show, this is the type of Carl scene I was talking about before. Just how matter-of-fact and calm he is about a stranger chilling in their house is something I would have absolutely loved to see more of. Especially when we get scenes like him just chilling with Judith to contrast that darker nature of his. I would have loved for the TV Carl to be given a sort of a carol story of where on the surface he's super chill and not really that threatening, but he always has that killer instinct that can turn on whenever necessary. Which again, could have been made even easier if we got a direct follow-up from him getting shot. Of course, don't take this as a grand and fully thought out rewrite or anything, as there are a lot of externalities that would have to change for this type of story as well. But again, it's rather the lack of any story when it comes to Carl that I have a problem with in the show. So it's merely me throwing out ideas that could have been incorporated even with the older Chandler and all the changes we've already discussed at length in previous episodes. So yes, I am fully aware that the idea has millions of holes in it, it is just an idea. And enough about that for now. Another change here is the group immediately swarming Rick's house and being ready to let loose on Jesus. Again, he's being held in custody in the book, so this obviously does not happen. But it essentially just conveys the preparedness of the Alexandrians at any moment. But following this, there are a few more notable changes to Jesus' introduction to the group. Notably, him making it blatantly clear that he already knows the ins and outs of Alexandria very well. Commenting on their armory, talking about their provisions being low, and even thanking them for a cookie he stole. In the books, he really didn't know much about Alexandria at all. 
Another thing that is remixed for the adaptation is that Jesus says he trusts the group because Rick and Daryl didn't leave him behind on the road. In the books, on the other hand, that trust was secured by none other than Carl. This happens a little bit later, but Jesus would say that he had a good feeling about the group already, but it was Carl who solidified his beliefs, as no group of bad people could raise a kid like Carl in the midst of this apocalypse. And again, notice how Carl's role in this entire thing isn't changed or remixed or anything like that, it is simply removed. But one moment that they very much left untouched is Jesus's... Your world's about to get a whole lot bigger. Which nicely leads us into their journey to Hilltop. There are a couple of notable differences here right off the bat. First of all, the characters going on the journey are changed, which would also affect the story later on. In the books, it's Jesus, Andrea, Michonne, Glenn, Rick, and Carl who snuck in the back of the van. While in the adaptation, it's quite a larger group, but the most important part here is that it's both Maggie and Glenn that are going. In the books, Glenn would later make it pretty clear that if Maggie and Sophia had gone with them during their first visit to the hilltop, they would have stayed there. While in the adaptation, while they do still talk about returning to the hilltop as well, it's not really as explicit of a goal as it was in the books for them. And on top of that, because Maggie's pregnancy is further along in the adaptation, there's also the added question of needing to see a doctor on this visit, which would of course play into the season finale as well. Another notable change here is the presence of Abe. Now, I know you're expecting some grand story change here, but all I wanted to mention is the pancake-making conversation with Glenn, because that is literally the best out-of-context scene I've ever seen. I'll ask you a question. When you were, uh, pouring the Bisquick, are you trying to make pancakes? Jokes aside, it's essentially this trip that makes him rethink his relationship with Rosita and ultimately break up with her for Sasha. And there are a few more notable changes in terms of events here as well. For instance, the whole pit stop where they save the Hilltop's doctor never happens in the book. Instead, they stop a couple of times for bathroom breaks and whatnot, but the most notable events are us finding out that Carl had indeed snuck onto the van, as well as the fact that Jesus could have freed himself at any point in time. And that is even after they already had to fight off some walkers. So this just works to reinforce Rick's trust in him. And it's also here where the scene I mentioned before about him saying Carl solidified his trust in the group is taken from. When it comes to the arrival at Hilltop, I must say, they did an extremely good job of making the set look like Hilltop, but not really feel like Hilltop. Like at all. Remember what I said before? In the book, we hear that it is a community of over 200 people. While in the adaptation, it looks like an extremely small settlement. It looks like Hilltop, but the scale is completely off. To be fair, we never really got an explicit number in the show, so it may actually be a conscious decision to make the community smaller. But I think this is actually a recurring problem in the show. If you recall what I said during the initial arrival at Alexandria, that too felt much more sparse than it did in the book. And even if we skip to the present day, a common criticism, which I would agree with myself, is the fact that the Commonwealth does not feel like a community with 50,000 people. For one reason or another, I feel like the show has always struggled in establishing this sense of scale when it comes to these communities specifically. They have no trouble throwing like 50 people at Rick and the group during the satellite sequence, but in the hilltop, it legit looks like 10 to 15 people? I tried looking up a genuine number of extras for these episodes, and the only one I found is on the Walking Dead fan wiki, so do take that with a grain of salt. But it says that a mere 13 were used here, and that very much makes sense, because this does not look like a big group. The only exception for this in my mind is the prison and Woodbury sets, because those felt very, very accurate in terms of scale. In the comic, on the other hand, it feels so, so much bigger, and a single establishing shot already shows us more people than we ever saw in the TV version. I'm not exactly sure whether this was a budget decision or what, especially considering they'd later add 50 more communities, which, in my mind, was completely redundant. But without getting ahead of myself, there is absolutely no contest for me in saying that the comic version is what I think of when I hear the word hilltop. 
And I've talked a lot about various externalities that some of these remixes cause, and this one is no exception, because I think it substantially changes how we perceive the saviors. In the book, any group that can command something on the scale of Hilltop is very much something to fear. While in the show, I'm pretty sure if Jesus tried hard enough, he could take out the entirety of Hilltop by himself. So your perception of the saviors is already, even if merely subconsciously, altered. And because of that, I think the writers threw in a whole bunch more savior encounters to make up for that. And while that might have been a good idea in isolation, I think it ultimately turned the entire Negan saga into a bit of an arcade shooter, where everyone has infinite ammo and the saviors just keep on coming. Obviously, all of this is my own headcanon as to what made the Negan story feel so, so different in the show, but I genuinely think this sense of scale is one of them. Though moving past that, we have a few more changes when it comes to the introductory period in The Hilltop. In both versions, Gregory is an absolute joke and his whole name misuse is a commonality between the two versions. But the characters he talks to are changed in the TV version. In the books, as you'd probably expect, it's Rick talking to Gregory and introducing their community. While in the adaptation, it's Maggie who does the talking both here as well as later when it comes to the actual negotiation. This is just one of those changes that I honestly think was done with the benefit of hindsight. Considering that in the book, Maggie had already become the leader of Hilltop, it just made sense to build up her leadership here right away, especially considering she already worked alongside Deanna back in Alexandria. So all in all, a minor but a good change in my opinion. Though what follows is basically adapted one for one. In both versions, a member of the Hilltop returns and begins attacking Gregory. Rick quickly takes care of him and we get the famous... What? Number one, this is a scene that I think every Walking Dead fan can agree is absolutely incredible. If you recall what Rick said in the books about not even being bothered about the walkers and everything else of that nature, this is just the epitome of that. Just how unmoved he is by the entire thing really speaks volumes as to where the survivors are at this point. But number two, a minor but important detail here is that Carl is present as well. And notice that both he, as well as the rest of the Alexandria group, are totally unshaken by this. They already know that Rick will be totally fine. Though speaking of Carl, this is one of those scenes that drives home the entire tragedy of the We Find Ourselves volume. Rick is so worried about what Carl has and might become, he desperately tries to make sure he doesn't have to live through these things and just be a normal kid again, but time after time, Situations like this happen and all of his efforts are in vain. And considering where we're headed next, that would only be exemplified further. I've brought this up many times before, but if you were following the story at the time, you will have most certainly heard of the old man Carl theory, and I think moments like this really support that. While he's often not in the center of the story, when it comes to these super big events, a majority of the time, he is right there by Rick's side. So everything that has changed Rick is directly passed on to Carl as well. So, not surprisingly, in many ways, he is just as experienced as Rick himself. Oh, and fun fact, Kirkman actually thought about killing Rick in the initial Shane vs. Rick confrontation and making the story about Carl. So yeah, he is extremely important to the story. And that is perfectly showcased in the following couple of scenes. In both versions, it would be here that the group formally learns of the saviors, but note that in the show, they've already run into the group of them back in No Way Out. In the book, on the other hand, their entire group and setup is very much shrouded in complete mystery. But returning to the question at hand, as Jesus explains what they're all about, we get the scene of Carl speaking up and asking, If we kill all the bad guys, will you give us half of your stuff? This catches Jesus completely off guard, especially when Rick then speaks up saying that confrontation has never really been something they've had any issue with. So again, you can see how Carl's attitude toward the world is very much shaped by everything he's seen. Blatantly asking if they can just kill all of them seems like a totally viable option for him. But in essence, the promise of fighting the saviors is very much alike in the two versions. 
The biggest difference is that in the show, it is not a pact of protection or anything like that. Rather, it is a deliberate attack on the saviors with the intention to wipe out all of them before they even know what hit them. And with that in mind, it's here where one of the biggest divergences in the savior arc begins. As in the adaptation, as much as Negan is still very clearly the bad guy, you'd be forgiven for thinking that he actually went easy on the group in that lineup. But let's not rush ahead just yet. The next morning, we have a few more minor things to talk about. First off, after seeing Hilltop with his own eyes, Rick is even more confident in their future than he was before, saying that it's a beautiful day and even joyfully giving Andrea a kiss. Similarly, Rick and Glenn talk about how moving to the Hilltop might be a safer option for him, Sophia and Maggie, especially with Alexandria potentially having a new enemy. The remixes here are 1. Maggie is back at Alexandria while in the show she went with him, and 2. Maggie's pregnancy is yet to be revealed to Glenn in the book, so the baby is not even a consideration yet. And in a broader sense, I do think that Glenn very explicitly talking about settling down in this peaceful community that does farming for a living and so on, is once again building up to that stark wake-up moment we'd get with Negan. It's pretty clear by now that Kirkman does very much like these rug pull type of moments, and I think this was just establishing that contrast for what would come next. Though speaking of Maggie, as we already touched on before, here too, Rick's role from the books is remixed for Maggie. The idea is essentially the same. The survivors make it clear that they can be of very good use for the hilltop and essentially strike up a deal. Again, considering Maggie's role later, I think this makes sense. Though I do still want to mention the comedy in this scene that we didn't get in the show. As soon as Rick walks in, very similar to the live-action version, the first thing Gregory mentions are his injuries, how terrible they are, and asks Rick whether he has ever had to deal with something like this. Only for Rick to calmly say, I've been shot. Twice. And I lost the hand. And the next panel of Gregory just saying, Oh, I hadn't realized really gave me a good laugh. But anyway, following this point, in both versions the group packs up and gets ready to leave. Though before they do that, we do get a few more scenes of Rick just trying to express how important the hilltop is. Even saying that's what his leadership does, he sees its potential. And we get the iconic panel of Rick telling everyone that now that they know there's a bigger world out there, their hard work will finally pay off they'll be able to stop surviving and start living. Rick gives a somewhat similar speech in the show as well, but it's much more of a cold and calculated one expressing the necessity of the deal. And that hopeful tone is rather captured as we see the group look at Maggie's pictures of the ultrasounds. Though the biggest change here is obviously what happens on the way back, because in the show, we skip all that. Episode 12 essentially opens with the group already back home. In the books, however, it is a much, much different story, as it would be here where we have our very first savior encounter. This is essentially where the No Way Out encounter with Abe and his squad is taken from, though it does still have some notable changes. The van is stopped by a group of saviors, calling on the group to give them all their stuff and that Negan commands it. Rick responds by giving them all their bullets instead, as the group quickly shoots all of them down, all except one, to whom Rick calmly explains that, effective immediately, they are now the protectors of Hilltop, and continues by saying that if they give Alexandria half of their supplies, they'll also protect them, saying to report that to his boss. And while he does very explicitly warn Rick that this will not be pretty, that is all we see for now. Though do note that this takes place in issue 97, a mere three before Negan himself arrives. Whereas in the adaptation, we've already met the saviors both with Dwight in episode 6, as well as formally in the post credit scene of episode 8. For now though, just keep that in mind. And the last thing I want to talk about today is what we see back in Alexandria with Carol and Morgan, as it's essentially here that Carol's next major narrative arc begins. We've already seen her keep count of the people she's killed, and all of that is starting to boil over now that things have once again returned to some level of normalcy and she can begin to look inward. And all of that is exemplified when Morgan asks her why she never told anyone about Owen being kept prisoner, implying that even though she knew he was dangerous, 
she did not want to kill him. The Morgan Carroll arc will have its ups and downs in the future, that's for sure, but I do think that their dynamic really makes perfect sense. As I've talked about in regard to Season 6, it does feel a little weird that considering how important Morgan's arrival was in the finale of Season 5, he was pushed to the sidelines for much of the story. So finally bringing him back in, especially with Carol as their worldviews are massively different, was a great move in my opinion. And again, note that all of this is TV exclusive material. Carol is long dead and Morgan died in No Way Out. But the final scene here is of course the one that hits the hardest, as she leaves a cookie on Sam's grave. The worst part about this is of course the fact that this wouldn't even be the last kid Carol loses. But yeah, it's no wonder that she has started to do a little bit of introspection here. And alright, this time for real, the last thing I want to mention is a minor detail that I think must have been intentional. Just as Rick and his crew begin to arrive back at Alexandria, the skies become dark and a storm begins, very much signaling how their newly established deal doomed their entire community. I admit, this may totally be me reading into things way too much, but considering that just a few scenes before, Carol is walking around in the sunshine, and it's right as the van arrives that the storm begins, does feel very purposeful. But hey, even if it wasn't, I am still allowed to nerd out about it, okay? Though looking at the time, I can't believe I've rambled on so much about just a couple of episodes, so this is where we'll leave it for today. To very quickly summarize the main differences, while in both versions Alexandria has agreed to protect Hilltop, in the show, it's much more of an explicit assault type of plan, with an immediate attack planned very shortly. And on a similar note, in the book, it's only here that the group got their first ever encounter with the saviors, though they spared one of them and sent him back with a message. Though yes, with that said, next time we will finally be delving headfirst into the Negan saga. And that's the video. Trust me when I say that I never thought season 6 would stretch into 5 videos, but here we are. And I don't even want to think about later seasons, but with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. And let's also give a warm welcome to the newest member of the team, Walker Belcher. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my rambling, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye